In this section we'll look first at the external ear and tympanic membrane, then at the middle ear and the auditory ossicles, then at the inner ear and the sense organs for balance and hearing. The external ear consists of the auricle, which projects from the side of the head, and the external auditory meatus, or ear canal, which passes inwards to the tympanic membrane. We look at the auricle first. The folded outer rim of the auricle is the helix. The helix spirals down into the floor of the central concavity, the concha. The rim of the concha is defined by this curved ridge, the antihelix. Two projections, the tragus and the antitragus, partly hide the entrance to the external auditory meatus. The shape of the upper three quarters of the auricle is determined by the cartilage that forms its framework. We'll divide the auricle along this line to see the cartilage. Here's the cut edge of the auricular cartilage. It's highly elastic. The skin of the auricle is attached to the cartilage closely on the front, less closely on the back. The lowest part of the auricle, the lobule, contains no cartilage. To look at the external auditory meatus, we'll remove the auricle and the surrounding skin. The external auditory meatus is lined with skin. It isn't straight. It curves slightly upwards, then slightly backwards. The external meatus ends medially at the eardrum, or tympanic membrane. This is part of the tympanic membrane. We'll see all of it in a minute. The outer part of the external meatus is supported by a partial tube of cartilage. Here's the cut edge of the cartilage. It's continuous with the cartilage of the auricle. To see it better, we'll remove the surrounding soft tissue. Here's the cartilage of the external auditory meatus. It extends much further below than it does above. To see where we are, we'll take a look at the same area in a dry skull. Here's the bony opening of the external auditory meatus. The cartilage of the external meatus is attached to bone here. Here's the beginning of the zygomatic arch. Here, just below it, is the temporomandibular joint. The condyle and neck of the mandible lie just in front of the external auditory meatus. Going back to the dissection, here's the capsule of the temporomandibular joint. With a finger in the external meatus, it's easy to feel the condyle moving. Now we'll remove the mandible so that we can look at the external meatus from in front. Here's where the cartilage of the external meatus attaches to bone. We'll remove the cartilage to see the bony part of the external auditory meatus. This brings us closer to the tympanic membrane. Here it is. To get a complete view of it, we'll remove this part of the bone. This is the tympanic membrane. It separates the external meatus from the middle ear, or tympanic cavity. The tympanic membrane is so thin that it's partly transparent. This small upper part of the tympanic membrane, the pars flaccida, is slack. This much larger part below, the pars tensa, is tense. The tense part of the tympanic membrane has the shape of a shallow cone. It's drawn inwards by its attachment to the handle of the malleus, which we can just see here. The apex of the cone, where the tip of the malleus is attached, is called the umbo. The tympanic membrane faces downwards and forwards. This is a true lateral view of it. When seen from the side, it's tilted in this plane. When sound waves strike it, the tense part of the tympanic membrane vibrates. Its vibration is transmitted to the malleus. The tympanic membrane is formed of a layer of skin on the outside and a layer of mucous membrane on the inside, 
lying back to back on a layer of supporting fibers. The support fibers within the tympanic membrane are attached around the circumference, except between these two points, to a ring of fiber cartilage, the annulus. The annulus fits into a groove in the bone. To see beyond the tympanic membrane, we'll remove this part of the bone, leaving the annulus intact. This brings us into the lower part of the tympanic cavity, or middle ear. We'll see a little more of it by dividing the tympanic membrane along this line and removing it. Here's the handle, or manubrium, of the malleus attached to the tympanic membrane. Here below it, we can see how thin the membrane is. Now we'll remove the rest of the tympanic membrane. Here, we're looking into the lower part of the tympanic cavity. There's more of it back here and up here, as we'll see. This is the handle of the malleus. This is our first look at the incus and the stapes. We'll get a much better look at them later. Here in front is the opening for the auditory tube, which connects the tympanic cavity with the nasopharynx. We'll look at the auditory tube, then come back to the tympanic cavity. But first, let's look at a dry bone specimen to see where we've been and where we're going next. After taking the mandible out of the picture, we've been looking up at the underside of the petrous temporal bone from below. To see the tympanic membrane, we removed this part of the bone. Here's the bony external meatus. Here's the groove for the annulus. To see into the tympanic cavity, we removed more bone here. This is the lower part of the tympanic cavity with the three small bones removed. This is as far as we've come till now. The auditory tube, which is where we're going next, begins at this opening at the front of the tympanic cavity. It passes forwards and medially in a narrow tunnel in the bone. The tunnel is quite short. It starts here and ends here. Only the lateral third of the auditory tube goes through bone. Its medial two-thirds pass through a partial tube of cartilage that's represented by this added material. The cartilage of the auditory tube is attached to the base of the skull. Its medial end projects beneath the mucosa of the nasopharynx. To see the auditory tube itself, we'll go back to a dissected specimen. In this deep dissection of the infratemporal region, we've removed the zygomatic arch, the ramus of the mandible, and all the muscles of mastication. The external auditory meatus and the tympanic cavity have been exposed, as in the previous dissection. Here's the lateral pterygoid plate. The nasopharynx is here. This is the superior pharyngeal constrictor. Its upper border is here. The auditory tube is up here. It's concealed between these two small muscles. This one is the levator palati, passing down above the free border of the superior constrictor. This one is the tensor palati, passing downward and forward to go round the hamulus. To see the auditory tube, we'll remove the tensor palati and the lateral pterygoid plate. Here's the cartilage of the auditory tube. Here's the tube itself. To see the auditory tube all the way to the tympanic cavity, we'll open it along this line and remove this part of the bone. This is the bony part of the auditory tube connecting with the tympanic cavity. This is its cartilaginous part. The narrowest part of the tube is here, where it emerges from the bone. The auditory tube enters the nasopharynx here. We saw its emergence into the nasopharynx from the inside in tape 4. Here's the nasopharynx. Here's the back of the nasal cavity 
Here's the soft palate. Here's the opening of the auditory tube. The auditory tube, also called the eustachian tube, is normally closed. It's opened momentarily when we swallow or yawn by the action of the tensor and the vator palati muscles. Occasional opening of the auditory tube keeps the air pressure the same on both sides of the tympanic membrane. Now that we've seen the auditory tube, we'll come back to the tympanic cavity. In it, we'll see the three small bones, the auditory ossicles, that conduct sound vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. So far, we've just had a preview of this lower part of the tympanic cavity. To see the whole of the tympanic cavity, we'll remove the bone that lies above and behind the external auditory meatus. Now, if we look up from below, we can see the full extent of the tympanic cavity. With the auditory ossicles in place, the picture is rather busy. We'll remove them for now, along with the bone here and here, to give ourselves a clear look at the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. Two openings in the medial wall lead to the inner ear. The oval window, which is occupied by the stapes, leads directly to the vestibule of the inner ear. The round window, which is out of sight in here, is closed off by an inactive membrane that faces into the scala tympani of the cochlea. This bulge, the promontory, is formed by the basal turn of the cochlea. The facial nerve runs here in the facial canal, just beneath the bony surface. In front, as we've seen, the tympanic cavity is continuous with the auditory tube. Up here, behind, it's continuous with a collection of air-filled spaces, the mastoid air cells, which we'll look at in a dry specimen. Here's the tympanic cavity. In this skull, we've made an opening in the upper part of the mastoid process to expose the mastoid air cells. Here are the air cells. The tympanic cavity is through here. The mastoid air cells don't go anywhere. Collectively, they're a dead end. Now we'll put the three auditory ossicles back into the picture. They're the stapes, the incus, and the malleus. We'll start with the tiny stapes, the smallest bone in the body. The stapes consists of a head which articulates with the incus, an arch that's formed by the posterior crus and anterior crus, and an oval base or footplate which occupies the oval window. Here's the oval window. We'll add the stapes to the picture. The edge of the footplate is attached to the inside of the window by a membrane that allows it to move. Movement of the stapes sets up sound vibrations in the perilymph of the inner ear. The tendon of the tiny stapedius muscle, which we'll add to the picture, is attached to the head of the stapes from behind. Here's the tendon of stapedius. Its muscle belly is enclosed in bone back here. The stapedius muscle tilts the stapes backwards. The head of the stapes articulates with the incus, which we'll add to the picture. Here's the incus. The incus moves the stapes and is in turn moved by the malleus. The incus has a body, a short crus, and a long crus. The long crus curves medially, ending at the lenticular process, which articulates with the stapes. The short crus points backwards. The tip of the short crus is tethered to the wall of the tympanic cavity here by the posterior ligament of the incus. On the front of the body of the incus, there's a saddle-shaped joint surface at which the incus articulates with the malleus. Here's the joint surface. We'll add the malleus to the picture, together with the ligaments that hold it in place and the bone those ligaments are attached to. We've already seen 
that this part of the malleus that hangs downwards, the handle or manubrium, is attached to the tympanic membrane. In the dry bone, this is the manubrium. This is the head of the malleus. This joint surface, facing backwards, articulates with the incus. The malleus is suspended by two ligaments which are attached here behind and here in front. This is the anterior ligament, this is the posterior one. The two ligaments are in line with each other. The malleus makes a rotating movement through just a few degrees around an axis of rotation that's in line with the anterior and posterior ligaments. There's very little movement at the joint between the malleus and the incus. The two bones move together. The movement of the lenticular process causes a tilting movement of the stapes. Movement of the stapes is restrained by the action of the stapedius muscle. Movement of the malleus is restrained in a similar way by a second small muscle, the tensor tympani. Here's the tendon of the tensor tympani. The tensor tympani muscle is enclosed in a bony tunnel here above and parallel to the auditory tube. Its tendon turns a corner as it emerges from the bony tunnel. The tensor tympani pulls the manubrium and the tympanic membrane medially. The stapedius and tensor tympani muscles act in response to loud noise. Their action helps to protect the inner ear from noise damage. Lastly, we'll add to our picture of the tympanic cavity one highly unusual nerve, the corda tympani. The corda tympani, a branch of the facial nerve, emerges from bone back here, passes between the malleus and the incus, and leaves the tympanic cavity up here on its way to join the lingual nerve. As we saw in a previous section, the corda tympani conveys the sense of taste too much of the tongue. Now, let's review what we've seen of the structures of the external and middle ear. Here's the auricle, the external auditory meatus, the helix, the antihelix, the tragus, the antitragus, and the concha. Here's the cartilage of the auricle and the cartilage of the auditory meatus. Here's the tympanic membrane, the pars flaccida, the pars tensa, the umbo, and the annulus. Here's the tympanic cavity, the oval window, the opening for the round window, and the opening for the auditory tube. Here's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Here's the tendon of stapedius and of tensor tympani, and here's the auditory tube. On each side, the sense organs for hearing and balance are contained within a complicated cavity in the petrous temporal bone that's shaped like this. The cavity is known as the bony labyrinth. The bony labyrinth consists of a central chamber, the vestibule, the three semicircular canals, and the spiral cochlea. The cochlea contains the sense organ for hearing. The vestibule and the semicircular canals contain the five sense organs for balance, two in the vestibule, one in each of these thickenings in the canals, the ampullae. Inside the protective walls of the bony labyrinth, the sense organs are contained within a complex set of delicate membranous structures known collectively as the membranous labyrinth. We'll see these structures in detail later. Meantime, we'll begin by seeing where the bony labyrinth lies within the petrous temporal bone and how it relates to some visible features of the temporal bone. Seen from directly above, 
The bony labyrinth is aligned with the long axis of the petrous temporal bone. It's also aligned with this continuous cavity that's formed by the auditory tube, the tympanic cavity, and the mastoid air cells. This part of the anterolateral aspect of the bony labyrinth lies close to the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. In an intact skull, looking into the external auditory meatus, we can only see a small part of that medial wall. To see it better, we'll go to an isolated temporal bone and then take away all the bone that's external to the tympanic cavity, leaving this upper surface intact. This is the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. This is the oval window. We're looking through it into the vestibule of the inner ear. This opening below the oval window leads to the round window, which opens out of sight here. This thickening, the promontory, overlies the basal turn of the cochlea. Up here some cancellous bone has been removed to reveal the thick hard bone that surrounds the lateral and superior semicircular canals. Going round to the posterior medial aspect of the bony labyrinth, this part of the cochlea and this part of the vestibule are separated by thin bony partitions from the lateral end of the internal auditory canal. Looking at a skull that's been divided in the midline, here's the internal auditory meatus. We'll remove some bone here, so we can get a better view of the lateral end of the canal and see how it's related to the bony labyrinth. The basal turn of the cochlea passes beneath the end of the internal auditory canal. The vestibule is immediately lateral to the end of the canal. The component parts of the membranous labyrinth are the three semicircular ducts, each with a sense organ for rotational movement, the cochlear duct with the sense organ for sound vibrations, and in the vestibule the utricle and saccule with their two sense organs for linear movement. The utricle and saccule connect to the small endolymphatic duct which goes to a structure not shown here, the endolymphatic sac. The membranous labyrinth is bounded by a continuous membrane, which forms an essential barrier between the fluid outside it, which is perilymph, and the quite different fluid inside it, endolymph. In a cross-section, for example of this semicircular canal, this is the bony wall of the semicircular canal that's part of the bony labyrinth. This is the membranous wall of the semicircular duct that's part of the membranous labyrinth. The fluid inside the membrane is endolymph. The fluid outside it is perilymph. The difference between the two fluids is essential for the function of the sense organs of hearing and balance. To look inside the vestibule, we'll make an opening in the heart bone that surrounds the vestibule and the semicircular canals. This is the vestibule. Here we've also exposed the wide ampullary ends of the lateral and superior semicircular canals as they enter the vestibule close together. Back here we're looking downwards into the ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal. That's this one. Above it are two openings for the non-ampullary ends of the three canals. This one for the lateral canal, and next to it, this one for both the superior and posterior canals, which join together here before entering the vestibule. If we remove some more bone down here, Below where the oval window was, 
we can see the beginning of the cochlea, which passes forwards and medially from the lowest part of the vestibule. This pale structure, which we'll meet later, is part of the osseous spiral lamina. Down here, right below the base of the cochlea, is the round window that looks out into the tympanic cavity. Now, let's get back to the oval window. To see the oval window on the inside, we'll remove the bone up here, so as to make an opening into the top of the vestibule here. Here's the oval window from the outside. Here it is on the inside. The oval window is only an open window in a dry bone specimen. In the living body, it houses the foot plate of the stapes. A ring of fibrous tissue, the annular stapedial ligament, attaches the stapes to the edge of the oval window, giving it a small range of movement. Vibrations of the tympanic membrane are transmitted by the malleus and incus to the stapes. To see the foot plate of the stapes from the other side, we have again made an opening into the top of the vestibule, so we can look straight down into it. Here's the foot plate of the stapes. The movements of the stapes produced by sound vibrations, which in reality are much smaller than this, are transmitted to the cochlea. The essential structures of the cochlea begin right below the oval window, in the floor of the vestibule. We're seeing down here the start of two of those structures, which we'll be looking at later, the osseous spiral lamina and the basilar membrane. The main parts of the membranous labyrinth that are inside the vestibule are the utricle and the saccule each of which contains a sense organ, or macula, that responds to linear motion. Down here in the floor of the vestibule is the very first part of the cochlear duct. Also contained in the vestibule are the small passages that connect these components, the endolymphatic duct, with its branches to the utricle and saccule, and down here the ductus reuniens, connecting the saccule to the cochlear duct. We can see most of these structures in this dissection that's seen from an anterolateral viewpoint. This is the vestibule. The oval window was here. Entering the vestibule up here are the superior and lateral semicircular ducts. Here's the start of the cochlea opening into the floor of the vestibule. This is the upper part of the utricle. Contained within it is the sense organ, the macula of the utricle, which is one of the two otolith organs. If we make an opening in the utricle here, we can see the white layer of crystals, the otoliths, whose weight and inertia provide the stimulus for our response to linear motion. The utricle is also a manifold chamber into which the three semicircular ducts open. Their ampullary ends open into the utricle here, the non-ampullary ends here, with the superior and posterior ducts having first joined to form the common crus. Back here is the lower part of the utricle. The ampullary end of the posterior semicircular duct opens into it down here. The other openings are out of sight, back here. This is the saccule. Its wall is so thin that it's very hard to see. The saccule is shaped like a bent teardrop, lying against the anteromedial wall of the vestibule. The otolith organ, or macula, of the saccule is out of sight, here, close to the bony wall. In the floor of the vestibule, the saccule tapers downwards into a narrow duct, the ductus reuniens, which connects the saccule to the start of the cochlear duct. The three semicircular canals and the membranous ducts they enclose are perpendicular to each other.
They are now named superior, lateral and posterior. The superior and lateral canals were formerly called anterior and horizontal. The lateral canals on the left and right side lie in almost the same plane and their two ampullae function together in response to rotational movement in that plane. From above, we can see that each superior canal lies in the same plane as the opposite posterior canal. Their two pairs of ampullae function together in response to rotational movement in their respective planes. Here, after sculpting the bone around the semicircular canals, We've opened each canal so we can see the semicircular ducts. The dissection has been performed under water and is shown here under water so as to preserve the architecture of these delicate structures. We're looking from an anterolateral viewpoint. Here's the superior semicircular duct. Here's the lateral one. Their two ampullae converge to enter the utricle together. The lateral semicircular duct curls around out of sight. We'll see it again in a moment. Going right around to a posteromedial view, here's the superior duct continuing backward and downward. This is the posterior duct, joining with the superior duct to form the common crus. Here's the lateral duct again. The lateral duct and the common crus enter the lower part of the utricle, close together. The posterior duct opens into it here. Each semicircular duct is about one-third the diameter of its bony canal, except at the ampulla, where it widens to fill the canal. To see inside the ampulla will remove this part of its wall. This curved ridge in the wall of the ampulla is the ampullary crest. It's more easily seen in another ampulla that's been opened here, so we can look into it from this end. Here's the opening that was made. This is the ampullary crest. It's covered by a layer of hair cells which initiate our sensory input for rotational movement. The hair cells are acted on by a structure that can't be seen in a preserved specimen, the cupula. Here's the ampullary crest, with its layer of hair cells. This is the cupula. It's a soft disc of non-cellular material that forms a flexible partition across the ampulla. The hairs of the hair cells are embedded in its base. When our head rotates in the plane of the duct, Fluid inertia bends the cupula slightly in a direction opposite to the rotational movement. Running within a tunnel that's called the cochlear canal, the structures that form the cochlea are completely encased within the petrous temporal bone. Seen from above, the axis of the spiral is perpendicular to the long axis of the petrous temporal bone, pointing almost horizontally. However, it's common to describe the cochlea as if it was upright, with the apex at the top. In this dissection, all the bone that surrounds the cochlear canal has been removed, except for a thin shell, so we can see its overall shape. The cochlear canal begins in the floor of the vestibule, it first runs downwards and towards us, as seen in this anterolateral view, then makes two and three quarters spiral turns to end blindly here at the apex. We'll be returning to this anterolateral view, but for a first look inside the cochlear canal, we'll go to a dry bone specimen that's been divided in the horizontal plane, and look down on it from above. We'll flip our view so the apex of the cochlea points upwards. The cochlear canal spirals around a hollow bony core, the modiolus. Also spiraling around the modiolus are two bony structures, the interscalar septum, which separates adjoining turns of the cochlear canal, and this projecting shelf, the spiral lamina, which supports the basilar membrane. At the apex, the cochlear canal ends in a small dome, the cupula. 
beneath it, the two bony spirals end in interesting ways, as we'll see. Along almost its whole length, two membranes divide the cochlea into three compartments. This is the all-important basilar membrane, which houses the organ of hearing. This slender membrane is Reissner's membrane. Here are the same structures in a histologic cross-section. Here's the basilar membrane. Here's Reissner's membrane. The two membranes enclose the cochlear duct, which contains endolymph, separating it from the scala vestibuli above and the scala tympani below, which both contain perilymph. The cochlear duct is also known as the scala media. The bony wall of the cochlear canal is lined by a layer of periosteum. In this preserved specimen, we'll remove part of the bony wall, exposing the periosteum. This is periosteum. These black dots are melanocytes, pigment cells whose function in the inner ear is uncertain. We'll remove some of the periosteum so we can look inside. This is the cochlear duct. Here's Reissner's membrane, moving a little as it's touched with a probe. Removing part of Reissner's membrane, we start to see the basilar membrane beneath it. Here's the basilar membrane in full view. To understand it better, we'll go back to the histological image. This is the basilar membrane. Along its length, it's suspended between these two structures, the spiral lamina on the inside and the spiral ligament on the outside. The spiral lamina, which is formed partly of bone, projects from the modiolus. The spiral ligament is a thickening of the periosteum. The vital feature of the basilar membrane is the organ of corti that's just visible in a dissection. It's this little bump. This is the basilar membrane, which moves in response to sound vibrations. Overhanging it is the tectorial membrane, which doesn't move. Our sense of hearing depends on two sets of hair cells in the organ of corti. This triple row of outer hair cells, which actively amplify movements of the basilar membrane, and this single row of inner hair cells which translate these movements into sensory nerve impulses. Going back to the view we had before, this is the spiral lamina, here's the edge of the spiral ligament, here's the basilar membrane, and these two thin lines indicate the inner and outer hair cells. Here we can see almost the whole length of the basilar membrane. It starts in the floor of the vestibule and ends just short of the apex. Beneath the membrane here is the round window. To see it, we'll remove this part of the basilar membrane and spiral lamina. This is the round window. It's covered over by the round window membrane which faces medially into the round window recess of the tympanic cavity. The flexibility of the round window membrane is what makes it possible for the stapes to move and set up sound vibrations in the perilymph. To see what happens at the apex of the cochlea, we'll look from behind at a dry bone specimen where we've exposed this much of the apical turn. The specimen is transilluminated. This is the apical turn. This is part of the second turn. This bony layer is the interscalar septum that forms the floor of the cochlear canal. It curls around beneath the cupula, twisting to end in a short free border, which joins the underside of the cupula to the tip of the modiolus. This is the spiral lamina. It curls around to end as a freestanding half crescent, the hamulus, which supports the last part of the basilar membrane. Here's the same area in a fresh specimen, 
This is the end of the cochlear duct. The hemulus is here. Between the curved free border of the hemulus and cochlear duct and the interscalar septum, there's a circular opening, the helicotrema, where the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani become continuous. Here's the apical region in a specimen where almost all the bone has been removed. Here's the helicotrema. Here's the hamulus, with nerve fibers fanning out from it to supply the most distal part of the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane ends here, just short of the end of the cochlear duct, which is here. The modiolus widens to a broad base, which faces medially into the end of the internal auditory canal. The modiolus is the bony conduit for the nerve fibers going to and from the basilar membrane. The nerve fibers emerge through the base of the modiolus into the internal auditory canal, forming the cochlear nerve.